debate between California candidates for Senate Adam Schiff and Steve Garvey as the fight for control of Congress heats up. The spirited one-hour debate covered a wide range of issues, including the economy, abortion, immigration, and artificial intelligence. Garvey at one point calling inflation Schifflation. Schiff blasted Garvey, calling him a MAGA mini-me in a baseball uniform. Schiff is a sitting Democratic congressman who has served in Congress since 2001 and led the first impeachment of former President Trump. Garvey is a former baseball player for the Los Angeles Dodgers and San Diego Padres. He has never held political office. The Golden State is a deep blue state and worth 55 electoral votes, the most of any state in the country. And this race is one of 34 Senate seats up for election. 23 are held by Democrats or independents. Republicans can retake control with a net gain of two seats or by winning the 2024 presidential election. An upset here could have major implications on everything from the Supreme Court and guns to reproductive acts access and immigration. But polls show Schiff with a major lead over Garvey. And joining us right now from our L.A. Bureau is Zareen Shah to break down the differences each candidate presented on some of tonight's major issues. Let's start with abortion and Adam Schiff, who said this. I don't know what deconstructing the Constitution means, but I do know this. You worked very I'm, hard at I'm doing this. I'm for reproductive freedom, Mr. Garvey. You are not. Uh, and right. Californians deserve better than that. They're not looking for some MAGA mini-me in a, in a baseball uniform. They want someone who's going to fight for their rights, as I will do. MAGA mini-me right there. Uh, Zareen, uh, before Representative Schiff said that, Mr. Garvey said he pledged to show support for the voice of Californians. How did he manage to thread that needle? Very carefully, but Schiff, of course, called him out. So Garvey said that he was essentially that he was personally against abortion. He says that he was a Catholic. He says he believes that life starts at conception. But then he says he believes in the voices of Californians, that he supports the voices of Californians. He points out the facts that voter, voters in the state have built in into their constitution a protection for abortion. And Schiff didn't buy that. He basically said he was trying to have it both ways. And he tried in that moment, as, as well as many other moments, to try and connect Garvey with Trump. And, and Zareen, Garvey really resisted the notion of being a blind MAGA supporter. He admitted voting for Trump three times, but then he said this. But I can't imagine, uh, Mr. Schiff, how you could get up every morning and have one mission, and that's to go after Donald Trump. You've been made a proxy by the higher ups in your party, whether it's going after him concerning impeachment, all these things. And what did Schiff have to say? And, and how does talking about Trump align with his campaign this election? You know, I almost wonder if Garvey took the bait there. I mean, look, a lot of Californians do not align themselves with Donald Trump. And for Garvey to point that out in this moment could have been a gift potentially for Schiff. And Schiff says, yes, he investigated him. He said he helped impeach him. He says he was there on January 6th. And this aligns with something bigger. Look, Schiff has been traveling around the country in this moment on a lot of these national issues, talking about Trump, going to places like Ohio, going to Pennsylvania. He's going to Nevada and Arizona in just a couple of weeks. And so it feels like he's certainly running on Donald Trump on these national issues uh, in this moment because he is, yes, ahead in the polls. And this moment did feel like something that Schiff perhaps wanted, Lindsay. And, and the candidates had a heated conversation about immigration. They're both against the border bill. Vice President Harris back. Schiff tried to uh, tie Garvey to, to Trump again saying this. But, but I'll tell you what, you voted for Donald Trump now three times. You say you're going to vote for him again. This is somebody who wants mass deportations. <laughs> Someone who says they will enact mass deportations without the approval of Congress. So you're voting for mass deportations when you say you're for Donald Trump. And I'll tell you, that is not where Californians are. That is not where the American people are. Uh, and that is certainly not where I am. So, Zareen, where do both stand on the issue of immigration and border policy, especially Schiff? And Lindsay, you actually brought up a very good point that both of them are against Kamala Harris's uh, support for that immigration bill, for that border bill. And the reason they have different reasons. So Garvey's team says that, look, there was way too many other issues packed into that bill. Schiff's team essentially says that, look, they didn't feel like Alex Padilla was involved in the negotiations of that bill, so he didn't support it for that reason. But Schiff says they need to get control of the border. They also need comprehensive immigration policies, that they need relief 
for dreamers and farm workers and better check to stop people and drugs from coming across the border. Garvey, for his part, he talked about uh, border patrol, uh, building more facilities at the border that will detain immigrants. But, you know, for just an hour debate, for a local uh, debate with two people who are aspiring to be the next senator of California, a lot of contentious issues, Lindsay. Certainly, we did observe that. Zareen, our thanks to you. I want to bring in our good friend, 538's Galen Druk, to take a look at the polling. Glad to have you in studio with us. All right, so let's talk about how these two are polling right now in California. Yeah, so Schiff is leading by about 20 percentage points over Garvey. It's about 53% to 34% in the latest University of Southern California poll. And we see a similar dynamic in the presidential race in California, which is that Harris leads Trump by about 20 percentage points. Of course, there are fewer undecided voters in that presidential race, so Harris's numbers are a little higher, and so are Trump's when you look at the head-to-head -head for the presidential race. But in general, the Democrats in California this cycle are underperforming where Biden was in 2020. Biden won California by nearly 30 percentage points mm. in the last presidential election. So it looks like we're seeing some shift towards the right in deep blue California, something actually we have seen in some other very blue states like New York, for example. And Schiff does not want the shift, for no, sure. He, he, he for does, sure does not. not. He was trying to make his case and even making his case on some more conservative issues. So when they asked about immigration, the first thing he talked about was securing the border. Four years ago, I don't think that mm. would have been the case. You would have heard a Democrat first and foremost talking about how Trump's wall doesn't necessarily need to be built or how it's bigoted or talking about children in cages. You actually heard Schiff say first and foremost that the border needs to be mm -hmm. secured. What are some of the big motivating factors for voters in California? So. For voters in California, like voters everywhere, the economy is the number one most important issue, and it goes on down from there. But I think it's important to say, because this is a local race, that there are California-specific issues that rank very highly. So one of them, for example, is homelessness. In this recent University of Southern California poll, they asked about the popularity of Governor Gavin Newsom's recent initiative to clear homeless encampments, that got over 70% support amongst Californians. You know, there's another way of looking at politics in California, which is not necessarily Democrat, Republican, because it is a pretty blue state, but pro-building more housing and not necessarily pro-building more housing. So call it YIMBY or NIMBY. Mm. Yes, in my backyard, mm -hmm. not, not in, in my, my backyard. backyard. And you see a really stark split amongst Californians, whether they're in favor of increasing rent controls or not, or whether they're in favor of increasing taxes to help build more affordable housing or not. So whereas it's a clearly democratic state, and I think you know the majority of Californians will be voting for shift, when it comes to some of these specifics, on housing, Californians are very closely divided. And we heard a lot of that with regard to just how expensive it is to buy a house in particular Absolutely. in California compared to the rest of the country. How difficult is it for a Republican to win statewide office in California? Well, I think I can say that it won't be happening this year uh, in 2024 unless there is a polling miss that is outside the bounds of anything we have seen in a very long time. But look, it wasn't so long ago that a Republican could win statewide in California. I'm sure folks remember Governor Schwarzenegger of, of California. And actually, when Kamala Harris ran for attorney general for the first time in California, she barely won. Right. She won by just about a percentage point. And so we think these days of politics as being stuck in the mud, right? Everyone believes what they believe and not too much shifts around. That's not true if you look at politics over the span of a decade. And so California is very uncompetitive today, but as I mentioned earlier on, it has shifted back towards the right, and it may continue to shift. And so, yeah, while it's very blue today, 10 years down the line, maybe a Republican is competitive in California once again. Always love to have the context behind the numbers from you, Galen. Thank you Thank so you. much. And joining us now are Jay O'Brien. And Jay, let's take a step back for a second. This is just one of 34 races in the Senate. How does California factor in overall? 
Well, first and foremost, you heard Galen lay out the polling there. That's why Democrats feel very good about their chances in California and holding on to that Senate seat. But they don't feel as good in other places across the map because Democrats have to defend 23 Senate seats this cycle. And they only have a razor thin control over the Senate as it is a 51 49 majority. And there are a number of seats that do not look nearly as good for Democrats. We're talking about states like Ohio, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, West Virginia, where Joe Manchin was a senator. He was an independent senator that caucused with the Democrats. That's almost certainly going to flip to the Republicans. And then, of course, there's a very tense Senate race happening right now in Montana as well. Democratic Senator John Tester trying to hold on to his seat there. Point being, while there are safe Democratic seats that Democrats feel are locked in for them, like California, they very much do have their worries about other states and their work cut out for them there. And let's talk about that. In those states where Democrats are more vulnerable, how are we seeing those races play out at this hour tonight? It's interesting. I mentioned Wisconsin, for instance, Tammy Baldwin trying to hold on to her seat there. We've seen some new polling in that state that shows she might be having more troubles here. For instance, Tammy Baldwin, uh, there was a Cook political report out tonight that moved that state from lean Democrat to um, uh, toss up states. So a little bit of concern I've heard from Democrats as it relates to that. We've also heard about Montana, obviously. That's a Republican state. It's a deep red state. It's likely to go heavy for Trump. But John Tester in that state is trying to essentially run closer to Donald Trump than he is to the Biden Harris administration. We've seen John Tester put out ads where he has said that he's worked with Donald Trump and tried to essentially say that he worked against Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. Now, we've heard top Democrats say to Democrats, essentially, do whatever you have to do to win. But there are different strategies across this constellation of states and a very serious concern from Democrats that they might not be able to hold on to this slim Senate majority. How much does the top of the ticket impact some of these Senate races? Well, we've seen, for instance, Democrats like Tester try to run closer to Donald Trump because they view it as being more politically advantageous for them. In a state like Ohio, for instance, a Republican state, Trump also expected to carry. We've seen the top of the ticket be viewed as a potential benefit for Democrats in some instances in that, for instance, Donald Trump might turn off more moderate Republicans, keep them from going to the polls. Obviously, we won't know if that bears out fully until election night. But the other thing we've seen is even even in states like California, and we saw it play out in the debate tonight, the candidates who are at the top of the ticket take center stage on the issues. I mean, there was this moment with Adam Schiff where really one of the most politically fraught exchanges between the two was when Adam Schiff was essentially defending his impeachment trial against Donald Trump, in which he served as one of the impeachment managers, his conduct during the Russia investigation, and things of that nature. And then we saw Schiff tried to tie, essentially, Garvey to Donald Trump, paint him as MAGA, as you referenced earlier on in the broadcast. And Adam Schiff, while embracing the policies of the Biden administration, Administration and certainly supporting Kamala Harris for president, not really running that close to Kamala Harris, not bringing up her name that frequently tonight. And getting back to this particular debate in California, was there a moment tonight that stood out to you in particular? There was this one moment when we go back to that exchange between Garvey and Schiff about Donald Trump, about the Russia investigation. I mean, you know this just as well as I, Lindsay, that Adam Schiff is not a popular figure with Republicans on Capitol Hill. They stripped him of his uh, price committee assignment, choice committee assignment, rather, on the Intelligence Committee because they didn't like his conduct during the Russia investigation. Now, obviously, Democrats said that was punitive. They pushed back strong against it. But point being is a lot of Republicans wanted to see Garvey land a strong punch on Adam Schiff about that conduct. And when the moderators went back to Garvey for a rebuttal on that exact topic, he kind of took a beat and he gathered his thoughts and he didn't really land the punch as well as some Republicans would have likely wanted him to. All right. Well, Jay O'Brien, speaking of the moderators, joining us now is one of them. You just saw the candidate form there, KBC anchor Mark Brown, joining us tonight, hot off the presses. Uh, thank you yeah, so that much. Got my head what was that? Uh, it was it was fun. <laughs> I couldn't hear you. Sorry. Go ahead. It was fun. All right. Well, this is the last debate between now and the election. Uh, were there any answers or moments tonight that, that mm -hmm. you think will resonate with most voters? 
that will resonate, that's a tough one. I think uh, when when both candidates talked about their their vision of California, how they feel about California, and you you know uh, Adam Schiff talked about how Californians are struggling, and there are things that he wants to do to address that. Uh, Steve Garvey talked about how things how people are leaving California and how he uh, believes that supply side economics. Uh, uh, and, and a return to, I think he meant capitalism, but he talked about capitalization uh, was going to help Californians and really turn the state around. But that, that, that was probably the one moment. There were some other things, some kind of personal attacks that, that we tried not to let get out of hand. But uh, I, I think both tried to move the needle. It's a question of whether they were able to do that or not. Right, and, and I think you did a good job on keeping them on track. Uh, <coughs> earlier, we showed polling that, that showed Adam Schiff with a wide lead over Steve Garvey. How much do you think that tonight could actually move the needle based on what you saw? It would be very hard, I think, for Steve Garvey or any Republican uh, to move the needle in what is the arguably the bluest of blue states. So he's already got an uphill battle. Uh, he is very well known and liked, of course, loved because of his time with the Dodgers, but politically not well known here in California. So he has a, ba a, a, a big hill to climb. Adam Schiff, of course, has been a national figure involved in the, the impeachment process of uh, former President Donald Trump, much more well known. And in this blue state uh, where a lot of people supported that impeachment, uh, he's kind of had the advantage going in. And taking a step back, of course, you know your community there very well in Los Angeles. And I'm curious if there's a particular issue you feel like overall uh, the voters th that mattered to voters most tonight. Well, I think, and I'm not sure if anybody really addressed it head on. I think one of the biggest issues for voters here in California, particularly in Southern California, crime, homelessness, and, and, and quality of life type issues. Things are expensive. It's an expensive state to live in. It's been an expensive state to live in for a very long time. But people are starting to get the sense that they're not getting their money's worth, if you want to put it that way. That that uh, uh, crime, even though crime is down, the perception is that crime is up. Even though violent crime is actually trending down in California and in Los Angeles County in particular. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure either candidate really got to that as, as much as they needed to, 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 to address that particular concern among uh, the, the voters here. And they were trying to really talk about how they, what they wanted to do in the future. And, and Mark, I'm going to let you go here. I know you said it was fun. Anything that surprised you tonight? <laughs> um, the, they, they started to go a little personal, and that was surprising. Uh, the, the part at which uh, uh, Steve Garvey accused Adam Schiff of disparaging Garvey's mother, I thought, right. was, was surprising. And, and I hadn't heard anything about that before, and it seemed surprising to the people who were there. I tried to you know, bring them back on track. It was a little like herding cats at, at certain points <laughs> in this debate, i got to tell you. But I, I think both men uh, did their best. All right, KABC anchor Mark Brown, uh, job well done tonight. We thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lindsay. And now I want to turn it over to our Olivia Rubin, our investigative reporter who also covers the Trump campaign. Uh, Eliz Olivia, as we've already been talking about, of course, Schiff led to that impeachment uh, against Donald Trump. If we are to fast forward and just hypothetically say that both men end up in office, Adam Schiff and Donald Trump, what yeah. might that look like? Well, look, Adam Schiff, clearly someone who has shown he's not afraid to take on Donald Trump, both in investigating him and, as he said, I impeached him, could have the opportunity, Lindsay, to be a real thorn in the side of Donald Trump, someone who has been investigated for years and someone who is not kind to those who have investigated him. Look, they have both traded barbs over each other. Donald Trump has plenty of nicknames for Adam Schiff. He's called for him to be arrested, uh, saying that he's committed treason for impeachment. But think about this. If Donald Trump is in office and Adam Schiff is in the Senate, and if for some reason it's possible Democrats get control of the Senate, Adam Schiff could be in the position to once again be investigating Donald Trump. And it is something that Donald Trump has not been able to escape. And I think looking at the track record, we we don't have to guess. We can judge from history. It's very likely that if Donald Trump gets back in office, he's expecting to be investigated again. It happened during his tenure in office and it happened when he was out of office. So once again, we could have that matchup, which you can't underscore it enough. Someone like Schiff, who has shown they are not afraid to do that and has 
quite frankly, made a name off of it. It's quite often that we see Republicans really try to woo Donald Trump mm -hmm. to get his backing, to get his support, perhaps their endorsement. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen Garvey yeah. do that with Trump. Why not? It's fascinating. I mean, you heard Galen talk a little bit just about how unpopular Donald Trump is in California. So maybe he's just being practical and trying to run away from someone who's not going to get elected. And, you know, I know we say he hasn't run towards Donald Trump, but just to get a sense for the viewers of what that actually means, Garvey has not campaigned with Donald Trump. He has not been endorsed by Donald Trump. He did not attend the RNC. And at the last one of the earlier primary debates, he wouldn't even commit to voting for Donald Trump. He said that he was going to give both candidates a look. When you think about the political climate that we're in, that is sort of an unprecedented position. Though now he has said he'll Correct. Now he has, yeah. so of course, changed that. But at one point, that is not a position that you hear often from a Republican Senate in Donald Trump's Republican Party. So I think one of the most surprising things tonight also was his strong defense of Donald Trump in terms of the impeachment inquiry. He repeatedly told uh, Schiff it was unconscionable the way that he had gone after Trump. That's really different language uh, that we had seen from him so far. And Trump has actually used some harsh words yeah. against Garvey. He has indeed. Uh, it was sort of a familiar line that we've heard from Donald Trump. He would ask if he would endorse him. And he said uh, that Garvey was making a mistake by not running towards the MAGA movement and that he's not going to endorse until he gets a call from Garvey. And I was speaking to one Republican strategist who said that was just typical Trump uh, looking for loyalty rather than being smart or trying to make a good play here. But I think the bottom line is, you know, and we've talked about it a lot. I don't think that this is a race that Donald Trump or his team, you know, are losing sleep over. It seems pretty clear that Schiff is on a path uh, to victory here. And quite frankly, a, a number of people I asked about this race, just to sort of get their sense on it, they, they weren't even tracking it. Oh, very interesting. All right, Olivia Rubin, always a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you. And joining us now, ABC News contributors Amanda Renteria, Democratic strategist, and Tricia McLaughlin, a Republican strategist. Thank you both so much for your time tonight. Of course, the election is four weeks away from today. And while the race in California may not be close, polls nationwide have this presidential race at a dead heat. Taking a step back now, one month out from this election, let's get a temperature check uh, from both of you. Amanda, uh, where do you think Vice President Kamala Harris stands with one month to go? Well, there's a lot of work to be done. It is now about mobilization. I think they have run a really great campaign, but it really is these last 30 days where you have to hone the message, make sure your mobilization on the ground is working and you're pushing, get out the vote right now as mail is dropping. And so I think they're doing a good job, but every single day matters, especially since it's been such a short timeline for people to get to know her and Walt and the campaign team as well. So it is hopeful for her, but there's no doubt that she has to run every single day as fast as she can. And, and Trisha, what about for former President Trump? Amanda and I might not agree on everything, but we definitely agree on that. It comes down to the nuts and bolts of politics at this point. And part of that is voter registration. Yesterday was the last day to register to vote in Pennsylvania. Republicans have gained some ground there. They were getting clobbered in 2020, but have definitely improved in that area. They almost doubled their registrations in Arizona. In, in Nevada, they've seen massive improvement. And in North Carolina, as well as other ba battleground states. So I do think that this is not your 2020 Trump campaign. Campaign. There's more discipline on the ground. There's more discipline and message management from the candidate. So I do think Donald Trump is well positioned today. And, and now let's shift to the Senate, which, of course, is top of mind for many tonight. Uh, Amanda, Democrats have to defend those 23 seats, particularly in red Montana and a trending red Ohio. Do you think Democrats will, will keep the Senate? I think it's going to be very, very hard, but we have some really good candidates in these places where people know Tester. They really like to work with him. And those campaigns like Sherrod Brown, they're running from where they live, from where they are. They are smartly not necessarily getting into the national politics. And those are names that are very well known in communities and neighborhoods. And so the question is, how much will the national movement really push those states? But I will say the candidates themselves have been extremely disciplined plan to make sure that they're talking about what's happening in their backyards. And that's going to be a key point as people go to vote. And, and Tricia, is there any race Republicans are defending that, that might concern you? Or do you think that they're mostly on the offense here? I think Nebraska, that could end up being a toss up. Debbie Fisher is really fighting for her political life there. So we, you know, 
Republicans, there's new data coming out tomorrow, so I think we'll really see where we are. But I know some Republicans are a little bit worried there. I'm very curious to see what happens with Ohio. That's my home state. Sherrod Brown, he's been in office since 2008. Um, Bernie Moreno is a, a very strong candidate, and we know Trump is likely to win in Ohio by double digits. But Bernie Moreno is a relatively new candidate to Sherrod Brown, who's been in office uh, for more than a decade at this point. Amanda, anything in particular you're watching for in these last four weeks? It really is the mobilization game. So how are really votes coming in by mail? What are the teams doing on the ground? And then the other piece that's a little bit hard to see from a national level is what message are they saying on radio, online, in those key county and districts? And I do have to say the mobilization efforts that I've seen out of the Harris Waltz campaign is they have built very good relationships with leaders on the ground. And that is going to be critical because at this point it is neighbor to mate neighbor. How are you making sure to get the carpool so people can get to that ballot box? Um, that's what I'm watching for is what's really happening in each of these states at a county level. Trisha, how about on your end for the GOP? I think we really need to focus on early voting, mail-in voting, things that Republicans are not typically very good at. We can reliably get out to the polls, but we typically vote on election day, not before. So that's something that is new to Republicans, and I think our leadership really needs to be encouraging and emphasizing. Amanda Renteria, Trisha McLaughlin, we thank you both so much for your time tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you.